welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We're broadcasting on all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world. We're bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. Broadcasting on Facebook, on YouTube, on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on TikTok. Folks, please do send in your comments. Please do send in your greetings and tell us where in this country and the world you are watching from. We've got a packed show tonight. We're delighted to welcome as a guest at 7.30, Nick Mitchell from the We Say It podcast, which broadcasts on X and also on Rumble. And Nick's going to be talking to us about his project, his free speech project. There he is on the 1st of April outside Holyrood when many people gathered to protest the Anti-Free Speech Act, otherwise known as Humza's Hate Law. And so we're going to be talking with Nick about how he sees things at the moment, and we're going to be speaking with him about his, his project, which we need more of. We need more people setting up their own broadcast studios and reporting and speaking to people that the mainstream media is not necessarily wanting to speak about. So it's great that he's got that network that he's developing and he's going to tell us a lot more about it. And Nick is also going to be a speaker at our counter rally, our free speech rules counter rally this coming Saturday the 20th of April in George Square, Glasgow. And folks, this is shaping up to be something, something very, very interesting. It's going to be a very newsworthy day because at one end of the square, we've got that man there who is going to be pontificating to his followers about his uh, the righteousness of of his Anti-Free Speech Act, whereas not so very far away, there is going to be a force for good and there's going to be the rest of us who have come along to tell him that he is indeed mistaken and that his law is not needed, it's not wanted, and it must be repealed. And that's going to be our message to Mr. Hamza Yusuf this Saturday. So if you would like to join us, folks, please do come along. We'll be gathering from 1.15. We're expecting their march to start in March, so-called separatist shuffle, as we like to call it. We expect that they'll be entering the square around about 1.30ish. Um, between 1.30 and 1.45, and we're expecting their so-called speeches are going to start around about 2 o'clock. And the Scottish Nationalists have got a, an, um, a scintillating platform of speakers lined up, people who we're told are extremely well-known in their own households, but people that when you Google them, you need to um, start up their Wikipedia page for them because they're otherwise uh, unknown to the world. But apparently they've got something to say to the SNP and Scottish Cabbage Party rally because it is indeed um, a dual effort between the Smurf people and the Scottish Cabbage Party, otherwise known as the Soggy Greens. And together they have excluded the Alba people who are not very happy about it and they've also excluded the all under one banner people who are the grassroots marching wing of the Scottish separatist movement. So, quite frankly, who's going to turn up for the SNP Scottish Cabbage Party march? Everybody waits with bated breath. It may even be that a force for good will have more people at our rally than 
the Scottish Cabbage Party and the SNP. And wouldn't that be a turn up for the books? And wouldn't that be the story of the day? So you could be part of history. You could be part of history if you come along and join us on that day because we were there. We were there um, back in 2019, the last first minister to address the uh, to address George Square was, of course, Nicola Sturgeon. And she was the last because she never came back after the reception that she received from a force for good. She decided that it was far too much bother. And so she never addressed another public rally in George Square ever again. And something tells us that this is probably going to be the last rally that Humza will bother to attend as well, because after Saturday, he's going to say, forget this for a laugh. I've got better things to do on a Saturday afternoon than stand and listen to Alistair McConaughey and a force for good um, harangue me with uh, Bay City Roller songs such as Bye Bye Humza, Humza Goodbye. Oh, indeed, that's going to be our message to him. Folks, let's see what you've got to say. Derek's straight in tonight. And he's saying that he's informed that the Scottish Disassembly are at it again, putting more tax onto Scotch whisky. Wouldn't surprise me, Derek. However, there was a vote today in what you're calling there the Scottish Disassembly. And the Conservatives had put forward um, a motion to repeal the hate speech so-called law. And going to press right now, we've not been able to find out how that went. So if anybody's got any information about that, if you know how many people voted, if there's someone that tells us how many Labour and Lib Dem people voted with the SNP, then we would be very interested to know because, you know, we have a go at the SNP and the Scottish Cabbages, but sometimes we expect a wee bit more from Labour and Lib Dems, but so often they let us down, so often they don't step up to the plate, so often they've got an open goal and they run and kick the ball in the opposite direction and start playing for the other team. So this is a big problem that we're facing with Labour and Lib Dems in Scotland. But if we, anybody can find out what happened there and we'll try to report that by the end of the show. That was the vote today to, the motion today to repeal the Anti-Free Speech Act. <laughs> Ziggs the Wolf says, Good evening, old Brits. Been a long time, Alistair. Hope you are well. We are well. Hope you are too, sir. Ryan's looking in from the West Riding of Yorkshire. Good evening to you, sir. As is Derek from Armadale and Catherine. Geoffrey Hunt says, God bless Great Britain. I second that emotion. Um, Lego Rocker says that they're going to be, the, that, that the Scottish nationalists are going to try to disguise themselves as an orange parade. Well, the way things are looking at the moment, I'm afraid the orange people sometimes get, uh, are sometimes subject to the Anti-Freedom of Assembly Act as well, because there was, now I need to get this straight, I don't have the notes to hand, but a local council about a month ago actually banned a march. I think it was in some point in Aberdeenshire. They actually said, no, you can't march, which really is wrong because whatever you may think of people on whatever side of the political platform, if you believe in British democracy, then you have to allow people to march on the streets you really do have to allow that. You can't be saying, no, you can't march because we don't like your, in this case, the fact that you're an Orange Lodge. That was really wrong. And it was a serious, a serious infringement of the freedom and the right of anybody to assemble and to walk the King's Highway in our country. That didn't get enough attention. And there's people set up... Uh, um, 
an online poll as well to try to stop a march in Inverness Shire, I think, and like 5,000 people have signed it. That was reported in the National today. What ridiculous. Let people march. You don't have to agree with them. Catherine talks about who on earth is going to be there supporting the SNP on on Saturday. Well, we do believe it's going to be the youth wing of the SNP because it's been organised by the youth wing. They call themselves pensioners for independence. And they are essentially the youth wing of the SNP. So it's probably them if they're able to actually get all the way from Kelvin Way right down to George Square. If they do, they do deserve a round of applause for that. Um... Blue Bear says, as long as they play Jacobite tunes. If you silence one, you silence all. Hello to Scotland Scorpion. Anselman says, historic political struggles should be allowed to be celebrated. Good. Well, folks, let's talk a little bit here about the hate speech law before we bring in our man, Nick Mitchell, at 7.30, who's going to be telling us about his project, which is called We Say It. And he's also going to be one of our speakers at our rally, which a counter rally, you could say, which is going to be on this Saturday. Getting excited about that. That's getting close. And it's going to be a good one. Somebody there singing along with the Bay City Rollers tune. Thank you for that. So Shang Alang, a bang alang. Let's get Hamza out. Christopher says, Good evening from Falkirk. SNP comedy leaflet delivered through my door today. Contains countless lies and deflections. We have got some news here that says the move to repeal the hate speech law fails today. Well, the motion lodged by the Scottish Conservatives was voted down. Well, that's disappointing to hear, but it's not surprising to hear. So, here we go. Look at this. Yusuf's hate crime laws drive Yusuf's hate crime laws drive costs taxpayers almost four hundred thousand pounds. Almost four hundred thousand pounds in taxpayers' money was spent on promoting the SNP's new hate crime laws. The Hate Hurts advertising campaign focused on the pain words could cause urge Scottish people to make complaints to police. That's an important point. The SNP was actually publicising the law and saying, complain to the police. It was an adv advertising campaign to encourage people to complain. It didn't give them any guidance on what to complain about. If you looked at these signs, there was no guidance there on, here's what you should complain about, here are the words, here's here's what constitutes a crime. It was no, basically, if you don't like something that somebody has called you, then complain to the police. So that seems quite a, an irresponsible way to, to uh, constitute your advertising campaign. No guidance or anything, just an encouragement to overload the police with complaints because you didn't like words that you've heard or have been perhaps used in your vicinity or against you, but mainly what you've seen on social media. 
encouraging people to complain about that, encouraging people essentially to overload the police without saying such. Very, very irresponsible of the Scottish executive to do that. And it cost £400,000. That's £400,000, which could have been used or could have been given to the police to help them solve crimes, to help them investigate actual crimes that have been committed. But no, £400,000 in order to encourage people to make which are likely to turn out most of the time to be silly or malicious complaints to the police. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your taxpayers' money being spent by this Scottish executive. Swamping the police with vexatious complaints. And you know, if the police don't consider that it's that the threshold for a criminal act has been reached, which means if they don't consider that there was any intention to stir up hate, and if they don't consider that it was likely that hate could have been stirred up, then they're still going to record the incident anyway. And they're going to note it as a non-crime hate incident. So, there's lots of these, they're called NCHIs, non-crime hate incidents. And they'll record what happened and they'll record your name and they won't tell you and it'll be on a record, but a record that can be searched by anybody who's got the authority to search it, including potential government employers, for example. So that is a national scandal. And this was brought up in England and Wales last year. And the government and police in England and Wales looked at it and they said, we're going to stop doing this for almost all of these NCHIs and we're only going to record it if it was a sufficiently serious incident that we think is important to record for whatever uh, guidelines they had for that. But here in Scotland, you can you can uh, phone them up, said my next door neighbours just called me a BAM and I find that hateful. And the police will go, okay, so let's take his name and... He had no intention to stir up hatred against BAMs worldwide, but it is a sufficiently serious thing for us to record that as an incident. We'll write his name down here, and that will be forever on his record. And the poor neighbour's not even going to know about it. That's completely mental. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have said mental. <laughs> But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. So this was noted actually by a good letter here in The Scotsman on the 1st of April. Every time the Scottish government is called on to defend its new hate crime act, it reiterates that the threshold for proving criminality will be high. But surely the problem is not the threshold for proving a crime but the threshold for proving a non-crime incident, which seems to be, quote, someone was offended. The idea the police should occupy themselves with investigating non-crimes is fairly new. The question no one seems to be asking is, what will be the future impact on an individual of having a non-crime hate incident recorded against them? Will it show up in a DBS check? Will they be required to declare it when applying for a job or visa? People accused of non-crimes are not being given the same opportunity to, to defend themselves as those charged with criminal offences. Yet the impact on their futures could be every bit as devastating as an actual criminal conviction. That's a good letter that appeared there in the Scotsman on the 1st of on the 1st of April. And 
from that is also an important legal principle that we can derive is who is making the judgment there. You're giving the police a huge amount of um, discretion to decide what's a frivolous complaint, what's a vexatious, malicious complaint, what's a vexatious, malicious complaint that's not a crime, oh, but this vexatious and malicious complaint is pro probably a crime, so we're going to take it further. You know, where is the balance there? Where's the balance? Who decides that? Where are the guidelines for that? Clearly, there are none, because as we've seen, there's been thousands of complaints made against Hamza Yusuf for his notorious Rivers of White speech, which, by their standards, one would imagine could be be and should be reported as a non-crime hate incident, but you see, they've not recorded it as such. And of course, people are then going to lose faith in the police because they're going to say, well, you just refuse to record that because he's the first minister. And then there's um, J.K. Rowling, who made a series of tweets on the 1st of April in order to test the law. And the police have said, no, that's not breaking the law. But they haven't recorded it, and they're not going to record it as a non-crime hate incident. Why? Is it because J.K. Rowling is so famous and they don't want the hassle? But they will record it if you're just a, a normal woman with no money who's been, who's been reported upon. And so... Another thing about this is it, it encourages us to lose faith in the police. And this is what happens with bad law. Law has to be exact. It has to be clear. It has to be written down. It has to say, that's vexatious. That's frivolous. That will be recorded. You have to stick to what's called the black letter of the law. When the black letter of the law does not exist, then it's just left to people's subjective opinions on things. And then everything just becomes unfair because it seems that people are being treated differently depending upon their status in society. And so that's another wrong thing about this particular law. Alan says, good letter. It's disgusting how we are treated. Yes, Mark Yeti says, Hamza Useless was allowed to defend his non-crime hate white incident, which was basically copying Anas Sarwar as well, because Anas Sarwar set the trend for that. He was actually the first, albeit less publicised person. Now, Joanne Cherry is not necessarily an MSP, sorry, an MP. I'll start that again. Joanne Cherry is not necessarily an MP that we would agree with on everything. She is an SNP MP but she has been fairly good with the anti-free speech approach. And she wrote a good letter, sorry, a good article in The National, which we read so that you don't have to. Scotland might be independent by now, but for focus on identity politics. Well, Joanne, Scotland's not going to be or not would have been independent by now, I have to tell you. But nice headline anyway. But she does make a good point here about the 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 obsession that the Scottish National Party and the Scottish Cabbages, especially the Scottish Cabbages, have with identity. And she points out, and we've mentioned this before, that when this law was put together, they wanted, Joanna Cherry and her colleagues, wanted very strong freedom of speech defences to be written in, uh, which were not written in, but should have been written in. And these recommendations were put forward by Lord Brackadale. And she says, the Scottish Parliament did not follow his recommendations in this respect, although it did for religious beliefs. So for religious beliefs, it's a defence to say you were simply discussing it, criticising it, expressing your dislike of it, expressing your antipathy towards it, ridicule, insult or abuse. Uh, that's allowed against religion 
interestingly enough, but it's not allowed against, for example, gender identity issues. So, she, she goes on here, points out that that was not allowed as a defence. And she says, let me explode another myth. England does not have identical legislation to the new Scottish Act. We hear that all the time. It does not have. It does not have it. The legislation in England that deals with stirring up offences covers race, religion and sexual orientation. It does not cover transgender identity. It deals with behaviour which is threatening, not behaviour which is threatening or abusive, because that's a whole other field of behaviour. And it has properly tailored defences of the sort recommended by Lord Brackadale. She says that the offence in Scotland is much more widely drawn and the absence of the tailored defence has led to legitimate fears that the law would be used to silence gender-critical women. She says, I suspect that if an ordinary woman had tweeted in the same terms as J.K. Rowling, she might not have got off so lightly. In 2021, I returned briefly to my practice at the bar to defend a woman who had been charged under laws then in force in respect of tweets which were not dissimilar to J.K. Rowling's. If anything, they were a bit tamer. However, she was not a rich, internationally respected writer and philanthropist. She was just an ordinary working-class woman. The charges were dropped after detailed legal representations were made that they breached her rights to freedom of belief and freedom of speech. However, not before she had been put through the ordeal of attending a police station and court on several occasions and having her face all over the newspapers. And she goes on to talk about the non-crime hate incidences and she makes a good policy suggestion here. She says the police, quote, need to wipe their existing database of non-crime hate incidents and to carry out a proper review of their policy or else they could be facing a torrent of legal claims. Finally, I think it is important that the blame for this flawed legislation does not rest just with the Scottish Government and SNP and Green MSPs. This bill had some enthusiastic cheerleaders in the Scottish Labour Party and the Lib Dems who now seem to have gone to ground. Here, here, absolutely, let's not forget them. Good. Folks, in a couple of minutes, we're going to bring on Nick Mitchell of the We Say It podcast. Send in your comments here on your thoughts. And please do welcome Nick as well. He is a great chap. He was at, and by way of introduction, we'll just bring up the picture of him at Hollywood as well, where he had a very good and effective poster which said, I control my tongue, not the government, nor the police. My freedom of speech is my human right. I will not be silenced. Folks, please say hello to a man, Nick. Good evening, Nick. Good evening, Alistair. How are we doing? Doing very well and very excited about Saturday and very grateful that you're going to be a speaker there as well. It's going to be a, a very good day and delighted that you've stepped up to speak about these matters. And before we get into just why these matters motivate you, please could you, by way of introduction, Tell the viewers a bit about your journey. Why are you, how did you get to the point where you're sitting where you are with a We Say It banner in the background, which is the name of your podcast? So pretty much, I've always been very outspoken. I've had very strong opinions on various different things. 
And I finally just got to the point where I decided, you know what? I've said enough to certain people. I now need to say it to a bigger audience. I need to allow my voice to be heard, not only for myself and my family, but for the people of Scotland, for the country that I live in, for the country that I love, and what's been doing to the country or what's been done to the country is something that I would never thought I would have seen in my lifetime. But I decided that enough is enough and I now need to speak up. And that's where I led to where I am. And I named it, we say it, simply because of my slogan on the back of my jumper is we say it how it is, as it is, we say it podcast. <clears throat> because I don't beat about the bush, I just say it. And sometimes it gets me in trouble, sometimes it doesn't. When you say in trouble, have you had any issues with social media platforms um, and you're, you're saying it? I have had maybe a dozen videos removed from YouTube for misinformation, medical misinformation, hateful behavior, hate speech. Now, bear in mind that these videos take me about anything between eight to 12 hours worth of work on the streets of Glasgow and the streets of Edinburgh and further afield to try and get just a 30 minute video. <clears throat> you know, 12 hours of work for a 30 minute video and YouTube rip it down like it's nothing. Uh, not only YouTube, but I have tried to grow on TikTok as well. I have just passed the 3000 follower mark on TikTok, which has been a bit of a struggle because every other week I'm banned on TikTok as well. So do you think it's because of people using this word again, making malicious reports because they don't, you know, like your message or they cut your jib or something like that? That is it. They, they're scared of the truth. They don't want to accept the truth. The truth, and, and the, the best part about it is, is the truth isn't coming from my mouth. I'm just purporting the truth. The truth is coming from the higher ups. They're telling you in plain sight what they're going to do. People are living in this false reality, this false delusion where they think that everything is all sunshine and rainbows, that the government can do no wrong, that the government have got our best interest at heart, where they don't. But what people need to remember is the government meant, are meant to work for us. We do not work for them. And I think this is where people forget that, that we can effectively tell them what to do, not the other way about. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. And it's the same with this issue at the moment with the, the hate speech. It's the old view which I cling to is that the police are there as servants of the people and that's that works until you start bringing in ideology into it and you start then having ideal ideological policing and the police are basically uh, policing things as a consequence of what they're t told they're like um how should I put this? Uh, maintaining government policy. Uh, we saw that in 2020. We saw it. We're seeing it just now with all the the hate speech and the police deciding what's what has broken the ideological um, barrier here. Oh, that's that's not approved speech. And so the police are being asked to make. It's ideological policing and the police are being asked to police on the basis of ideology, government ideology, when it, should, it shouldn't really have ever got into those grounds. It should simply be, oh, you threw a brick through my glass house. Yeah, we're going to arrest you for that. You nicked somebody's bike. That's wrong. We're going to find you and stop you doing that. Like simple stuff, breaking the law things, not, oh, he's made, an, he's made a thought crime. It's an, he's made an ideological error. You know, he's committed a sin against 
the ruling ideology. That's not for the police to get involved in. At least it shouldn't be. And to the extent that they have to, it should be a bare minimum kind of thing. Well, here's the, here's the funny thing. If you stand up in a court of law, you're asked to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That is what you are under oath. Now, if you are standing there being trialled by a jury of your peers in a courtroom to swear to tell the whole truth when it comes to a hate crime for something that you have said, okay? Mm -hmm. If you lie, then you are lying. But if you are simply stating an objective fact or the truth, regardless whether it's hateful or not, you are under oath to do that. So how can they sentence you for doing that when people need to think about it that way? Mm. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. So you, you're still broadcasting then on TikTok? I'm trying. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely trying. I, my TikToks are very few and far between. I do, I tend to post more videos right. rather than do live broadcasts. And my videos are received with very varied messages. I am the man with a label on many labels now. And it's quite refreshing to know that when people hate you, you must be doing something right. That's the way I like to look at it. If, if you were doing something, you know, wrong, of course you would be told you're doing something wrong. But the majority of my podcast, as it were, are over on Rumble. And that's for a varied amount of reasons why. Right, right. Well, we just put up your TikTok one there, which is tiktok.com forward slash at we say it podcast. Thank uh, you very much. requires that we at thing. But so you said you're on Rumble now. Um, let's put up your Rumble address. What took you over to Rumble? So initially, obviously, I didn't start on Rumble. I did start with YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and everything else. But the the censorship was just too much. And I've all I've been on Rumble for a long time now as a viewer because I didn't have the facilities to do live on Rumble. But I have now heavily invested in my equipment to be able to do Rumble Lives because this is something that I'm not just going to give up tomorrow. This is now a journey. This is now a mission. This is now a fight against, you know, the people we know who we're talking about. And Rumble is the last passion for free speech, along with X, formerly known as Twitter. Rumble has the marketing, Rumble has the platform, Rumble has the app, and it is built on the back of free speech. That is what they are building their business on. And we need to support the people who are supporting freedom of speech because this is only the beginning of this in Scotland. We are the puppets. We are the test subjects for this type of law. If people think that it's only going to be implemented in this country, you need to open your eyes. You need to understand that we are just the testing ground and it's only going to start building and building and building and going to more countries and becoming even more stricter in places where the policing is even more stricter than what we have in this country. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And Rumble's very interesting in that regard is that it does seem to be quite a bastion holding out as much as possible um, in a way that YouTube simply isn't. And that's a, a, a reflection of its owners and no doubt it's, it, its investors and so on who, who have got a much greater commitment to, to that kind of freedom of speech. And I think you're right. If you're involved in talking about things that YouTube are just going to ban you for um, and that includes and we broadcast on YouTube so I'm not even going to say things out loud but 
but they do have a list that you can look at on YouTube and anything to do with medicine and not going along with with certain elements of that or not going along with the results of elections, for example. That's another thing that you'll get banned for on YouTube, but you'll at least get to strike. And so if one was speaking about any of these kind of issues, there's simply no future for you to do it on YouTube, whereas building up a Rumble audience is is of value. But don't you find like on Rumble, it's mainly probably mainly Americans no, Rumble is actually becoming very, very known worldwide. And it's mm -hmm. because of specific people in this world who are promoting Rumble and sticking up for it, as it were. I think in the past six months alone, Rumble has had nearly a dozen court cases because of what it does and what it stands for. Now, if you have that many people trying to take down your platform, there is a reason why they're doing that. It's because they know that the people who are on there are speaking the truth and waking up the populace. Not only, like, in the, in the terms of things, Scotland is a very, very small country. The UK is a very, very small country, but it has a massive impact on what happens in Western culture and the Western civilization. So as a demographic, we are massive, but as a as a an island, we are very very small. So when you are on a platform like Rumble, and you say the things like I say, which I'm not going to say on certain platforms, when people start to listen to you and actually understand the information that you're giving them when they go to search another platform to be like, I want to find out if this is true, what he is saying, you won't find it or you will find an alternative where they spin it and make you sound like a right wing conspiracy theorist and all of this mm -hmm. stupid labels, you know, <clears throat> because I believe there is specific things coming for us all. And I'm 99% certain it's coming. But I think we're going to discuss that on a later date. So we'll save that one for a later date. But Good. while we're on the basis of Rumble, which I have my trusted little coffee cup, oh, yeah. you can support Rumble. And if you're a coffee drinker, you can buy the 1775 coffee which is proudly run by the people at rumble oh, yeah. and you can stop supporting certain companies who do certain things there you that's go. all i'm going to say 1775 coffee 1775 that's um cheers alex, alex jones always talks about 1776 uh, so uh, i wonder why they took it a year previous to that maybe that was when the american Presumably, that's when the American Revolution started to get uh, get going. I suppose. Coffee of the future. Build your <laughs> muscles. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you on on Saturday, and what I would suggest is you'll be speaking from our platform. We're, we've got a, a a good PA system this time. Uh, well, we've always got a good PA system, but this is a, a particularly good one. We've got two speakers. Uh, to you know um what do you call them the monitor uh, mm -hmm. like cabinets, boom box cabinets like, yeah 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 so we'll be able to be well heard so folks um do come along to that and you'll be speaking so i'm glad to introduce you to to people tonight i'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it i have written a speech as it were but knowing myself, it will get rolled up into a ball and thrown over my shoulder and I will say what comes from my heart and my head because that is what I do. I don't, you know, dull things down for people to understand. I just say whatever comes to my head and it, it, it comes out. 
Well, absolutely, absolutely. And it's always good to, to write stuff down just to help to order the thoughts. And then I find mm. once you've got it written down, um, it's your, your brain kind of remembers it. And then in the heat of the moment, uh, you're able to simply talk extemporaneously uh, as a consequence of you already having sort of prepared your subconscious with the general material that you want to get out there. Um, so that would be good. And what I also suggest is when you're not speaking, make sure, please, that you've got a camera or something so that you're taking videos of things that are happening and or speaking speeches that people might be saying and uh, if you use them you know get them out on your platforms whether tiktok rumble twitter i am going to try and film the majority of it myself uh, mm -hmm. not myself sorry my cameraman is actually attending that does my oh, camera excellent. work with me when i'm excellent. out in glasgow and edinburgh so he will be the cameraman for myself and anybody else throughout the day and also, if anybody wants to come and speak to me on a personal level and you wish to get a bit of insight into some things, you are open to do so. You will see the infamous red hat that I seem to wear in every one of my videos and <laughs> every one of my pictures. It's always the same hat. Just look out for that. And obviously, I will have my jumper on as well. Good. And any other, th the, the only thing that I would ask of the people is to just simply follow the X account and follow the rumble. That's all I ever ask of anybody. Mm. The The one thing that I, you know, that is the only one thing that I genuinely need from the public is the more people that can hear the message of yourself and myself and other people is to just simply follow the people because I did notice when I posted Niall's speech from the 1st of April, the amount of comments that were, I wish I knew this was on, or where can I find this, etc., etc. To those people, you're obviously not following the correct pages. You're not following the correct people on social media. So if you want to know the real information, if you want the real up to the minute information, the likes of yourself, and me and a few others just follow their accounts. That's all I ask. That's such a good point as well. Such a good point because you're not going to hear about this on so many other accounts. And uh, so if, so it's really, as you say, I totally second that emotion. That's what you've got to do. You've got to be following the right accounts so you get the right information. Um, otherwise, these things are just going to pass you by. And talking about your accounts for the benefit of people who will be listening on the audio-only podcast, your X account is x.com or twitter.com forward slash we say it podcast, all one word. And the Rumble account is rumble.com forward slash user forward slash we say it podcast all one word a little bit of a mouthful there but we get there absolutely and once you once you're there it's well worth the journey as they say well just to build on what you were saying there as well i'd ask everybody else who's who's watching if you're at the event on saturday please do bring your cameras do take uh, photographs put them up on your social media platforms do take videos please feel free to blast them around on social media because that's the way that our side gets out the information we can't rely upon stv or bbc hopefully they'll be there i'd like to think that they'll interview us i'd like to think that they'll speak to nick and so on but chances are they might not so we're relying upon everybody that's got one of these fantastic new inventions called a mobile phone or a camera and please do make the most of it nick great to speak with you looking forward to seeing you on saturday we'll be there from 1 15 we're expecting their speeches to begin around about two o'clock we'll be starting our speeches round about the same time as them 
it'll all depend upon the day and the dynamics of where we're situated and so on and so forth but it's going to be an exciting event thanks very much for being on the program not a problem thank you for having me on and allowing me to come on your platform i know it was a kind of a lot about me but i appreciate it any uh, any other way but we will definitely rearrange or sorry arrange my apologies a future one and we will go into depth i think on the things that we need to watch what we're saying <laughs> well absolutely and um i i I, uh, I've been on your show before on Rumble, which I very much enjoyed. That was two or three weeks ago, and I do look forward to being on your show again with you, Nick. So just remains for, for me to say all the best to you, and uh, see you on Saturday. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Good night. Fantastic. Nick Mitchell from the We Say It podcast. Looking forward to hearing what he's got to say on Saturday, please do come along to our counter rally in George Square. So let's put up a picture of our counter rally. Um, it's going all the way around social media. Um, picture of Hamza in his fantastic hat that we designed for him. There it is. Free speech Free speech rules rally. Get Humza out. Saturday the 20th of April, George Square, Glasgow. Humza is speaking at the SNP Green Rally. Join a Force for Goods counter rally at 1.15pm. Your chance to stand up for free speech rules. Okay. Going to be a good day. Going to be a good day. And it's going to be an exciting day as well. And we don't know quite how it's all going to go. But I think the big news of the day is probably going to be that a force for good got as many people there as the SNP Scottish Cabbages got. Because that's the way that it's looking. It really doesn't look like their march and their rally is going to be set in the woods on fire anytime soon. And all the other groups have boycotted it as well. So there's only going to be the SNP Youth Wing, as I say, and they're called Pensioners for Independence. And you're going to hear that joke at least a couple of times on Saturday, by the way. I'm very pleased with that joke. <laughs> Catherine says, thanks, Nick. Great chat. Christopher says, what a great bloke. Well done, Nick. Blue Bear says, level-headed dude. Well, you mentioned this last time, sir, and I don't quite understand why that is. We did look into that, but there's not very much we can do at this end, I'm afraid. I do try to speak very close to the mic, and I do try to do what we can, but we did we did take your... We did, we did test that this earlier as well, so... I'm not sure what's happening at your end, but we will, we will do what we can. Um, so, what do I want to talk about now? We've got six minutes to go. I just want to mention something which I read in the National Brown, Gordon Brown, saying that the Yes campaign is quote-unquote stronger than unionism. Well, we'll see about that, won't we? We'll see about that on, on Saturday. But Brown says here that he believes that, quote, in the long run, the forces pulling Britain apart are greater than the forces holding it together unless something is done about it. And in a way, he has got a point. I know what he's getting at here, but unfortunately, he does not proffer the solution. And the solution that Brown proffers is an extremely dangerous one, which will not work. Because as we wrote, we wrote an entire chapter in our book about Gordon Brown's proposals for the Labour Party when they get into power later this year. And their proposals, his proposals are 
basically more devolution and more power for Holyrood, which is to say more power for the SNP and the Scottish Cabbages to mess things up. That's Gordon Brown's solution, more devolution. He, his solution, another of his solutions is also to abolish the House of Lords and replace it with a Senate of the regions and nations. Now, the House of Lords no doubt needs reform, but if you're going to get rid of it and then replace it with essentially another level of federalism, which is to say um, an elected chamber from Scotland, electing people on the basis of their being from Scotland, electing people on the basis of being from Wales, on the basis of being Northern Irish, and on the basis of English regions, then that's going to be a second chamber which does nothing but squabble between the nations. And he's going to give the second chamber powers to essentially overrule the first chamber. So how on earth this man thinks any of that any of that is going to strengthen the United Kingdom. He must be living in cloud cuckoo land. So it's like he's always had a point that the union needs to be strengthened, but then his 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 answer is to totally ruin it and weaken it even further as a consequence of even more and more federalism and devolution. So the man is completely confused about that matter. But if you want... To be clear about things, and I really do suggest you get a copy here of One Big Country, a big book for the Union Volume 1. It's the first in a five-volume series. We'll be producing one a year. This is only nine ninety nine, and all you need to do is go on to Amazon.co.uk and search Amazon for One Big Country, and it will be the first thing that comes up. And we wrote an entire chapter. In fact, we wrote several chapters. Let me just read out their headings. Dissolving or devolving. The danger of Labour's federalist plan for the general election. And chapter 16. Assembly of the Nations and Regions. 11 reasons why it's a bad idea for the UK and for the Labour Party. All revealed in one big country, a big book for the Union, Volume 1. Please do check it out, folks. It's only nine ninety nine, and it helps to keep us on air because that's how we get kept on air. We get kept on air through donations and through purchases of our merchandise. Now, talking about that, if you can't make our event on Saturday, we do need help because we've got all sorts of transport costs, all sorts of equipment costs, all sorts of costs associated with this. So please do go to a forceforgood.uk forward slash donate to, and that could really help us. No donation is too small or too big. A forceforgood.uk forward slash donate to. And when you do that, you'll actually become part of the event because you'll be making it happen in a very real way. So please, guys and gals, become part of this event. Become part of this event and please help us with a donation. £3, £5, £500, whatever you can you can put in because our expenses are running into the hundreds. Thank you very much. Folks, it is the top of the hour. It was a good show tonight. Paul says, I have just had five copies of One Big Country arrive today. Fantastic. We were notified that there were five sales a few days ago, and I found that interesting. Now I know what, where they came from. Fantastic, Paul. Well done. Well, I know you'll make good use of them. When we're on the 20th, George Square, Glasgow, sir, um, at 1.15, we'll be assembling there, expecting 
the Scottish National Party rally at the other end of the square to be kicking off about 2 p.m. and running to about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So if you're in the area, please do, please do come along. And if you're not in the area, please come along anyway. We've got somebody coming down from Aberdeen. Um, well, we've got several people coming down from the Aberdeen area. Great book and reading, says Christopher. Screenshot right there. Alan says, great book for essential information. Okay, folks, this is the end of the program. We've got 320 people watching, but it's time to stop because there's still a lot of preparation that I need to do in order to get things sorted for tomorrow, in order to get things sorted for Friday, in order to get things sorted for the big day on Saturday. So, folks, it just remains for me to say thank you for watching. Thank you to our guest. God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King. See you next time.